Good morning. Oh, get out of here, Baxter. <laughs> he just wants to get my goat. Let's start with prayer to cover that. <laughs> Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you that you love even Baxter. <laughs> even in his mess. And that you love each one of us. I pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. I pray that you would <clears throat> help us to understand greater and greater who you are in us and who we are in you and who we are in each other, that we would grow into the uh, fullness of understanding of your prayer before you went to the cross. Father, that they would know that I am in you and that you are in me and that we are one. I pray that we would know that we are one. In your most precious name, amen. So today is my father's birthday. He's 89 years old today. He was born right before the depression hit. And like most people, my father, well, I would say all people, my father's a mix of saint and sinner. On the one hand, he's like Peter Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life. He was a devout Catholic his whole life and an architect by vocation. And unlike a lot of architects who did most of their work for people who could afford architects, my father had a passion for building churches, Catholic churches in particular, and helping to develop low-cost housing for the poor. He had a strong sense of social justice so that, like Peter Bailey, they could have four walls and a, and a roof over their head because it's deep in the heart of man to have that, he says. But the other side of my father was like Don Quixote. If you know the character from Miguel Cervantes' story, he was um, a commoner from the countryside who had, probably could be diagnosed as grandiose personality disorder with delusional occasion things, and maybe a little bit of narcissistic personality disorder thrown in there. So he, had, he was an adventurous spirit with a high moral character, and he wanted to fight battles. And so he took on this, uh, armor to become a gallant knight, and then he talked Sancho Panza into coming alongside him as his armor bearer, and they went off to fight these battles. And Don Quixote, in his delusions, thought he was fighting dragons when he was actually taking on windmills. And what he wouldn't listen to Sancho Panza would warn him, like, that's not a dragon, that's a windmill, and his lance would get stuck in the windmill, and then he would fall off his horse and and one time he's fighting this massive enemy of, of these bad guys only to find out that they were sheep and he killed several of them and then the shepherds beat him up and broke his jaw and stuff like that. My dad, in his inventions of wanting to help the poor have housing, came up with all these different things and one of them was actually a windmill, <laughs> not kidding. And it was a windmill that he was gonna put on he had this vision for putting it on an ocean liner or like a big ship outside of the coast of Ireland and it would catch all the wind and it would help poor people have electricity. Another one of his designs was, he called it a unibath. And it was, <laughs> this is a modern day unibath that I found online. I don't have a picture of my father's unibath. But he designed this thing that was made out of fiberglass that was like a bathroom all in one piece that was really cheap so that people could have this bathroom. That thing was in his uh, garage all the time we were growing up and then three different houses and then it was in the, and it never came to fruition. But then this guy came up with it and this was my, my dad was before his time because that was like almost 50 years ago when I was a kid. And another one of them was rammed earth housing. We lived in Arizona and so there's a lot of dirt and there's not a lot of trees and so he had these different inventions so that people could make their own rammed earth housing and all these different things. But my favorite one was this one. Who knows what this is? A septic tank. I didn't know what a septic tank was when I was a kid, but my dad developed this one, again, out of fiberglass, and I'm like, well, how is a septic tank? I mean, I didn't even know what it was, so how is it gonna help people have a house? And he explained to me that it was, you know, if you're not connected to the city sewer, if you're outside the boundaries, then you can have this thing. Well, he built a prototype and he, then he attached it to the back of his truck, his Ford truck. 
And so for what seemed like years, there was this big, huge septic tank attached to the truck, and we would drive around with this septic <laughs> There's a metaphor in that, right? <laughs> You could always find my dad's truck because there was this big looming septic tank on him. So if you're not familiar with how septic tanks work, they're, they're, it's when you're not connected to city sewer. And so there's this elaborate system, you bury it in the ground and, and, and all the plumbing, all the water and refuse goes into there. And then you have to have these drain fields or le leach fields so if the, the overflow can go into it, okay? The alternative is city sewer. And when you're connected to city sewer, you disconnect from the septic tank, and you're responsible for the plumbing out to the main line, and then the city is connected to that. Well, a septic tank is a closed system. It doesn't require the, you to be connected. You're off the grid, so to speak. And the city sewer is an open system, okay? Now, if you know me and you've heard me talk before, you're probably wondering, are we really going to be talking about crap again today? <laughs> I actually had at least three people say to me, are you going to say shit today? <laughs> What's that? We've released, we've released the Kraken. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the reason why I talk about crap is because it's the best metaphor for shame. And shame is the thing that keeps us from living from the thing that I'm the most passionate about, and that's helping people live from their Mago day. Okay? Uh, some people have even said, Katie, it, part of your ministry is to help Christians learn how to say shit. Because in saying it, we can face it. Right? Um, but it's also the most basic reminder of our humanity. Right? There's a story that says that Kim Jong-un tells the country, the countryside of North Korea believes that Kim Jong-un doesn't poop. Because if he pooped, then he would be a mere mortal, and he wouldn't be this mythological creature that's godlike, right? Because godlike creatures don't poop, right? Except my friend who had a three-year-old who wouldn't go to the bath, was, would refuse to potty train, she wouldn't poop on the potty, she was just afraid of her poop, which, if we're afraid of it, then our kids can pick up on that and they're afraid of it. So she wouldn't poop and so my friend was beside herself and, and she said, well, let's pray about it. So a little, call her Jill, goes into the bathroom and she's praying and she comes out and she goes, I pooped. And she said, because I asked Jesus and he says, I poop too. <laughs> Jesus poops. Jesus took on base humanity to the point where he pooped. And if you think that when he had his circumcision, he didn't cry, I would ask you to think again, right? He hurt also. He, was, he took on the fullness of humanity, right? But one time, I read this story about helping Christians get released from their conservative mindset that if you say shit, that you're going to go to hell. One of my favorite stories was this woman, I'll call her Heidi, and uh, she grew up in a a very conservative, very conservative, like small, uh, just almost cult-like small group where uh, you were a little Christian girl that you had, had to have long hair, wear skirts all the time, even when you're hiking or riding a bike or whatever, and just extremely uh, tight quarters. And every time her parents, she moved away, and every time her parents would come to visit, she would end up in tears and puddle because she couldn't live up to what they wanted for her, and she'd moved away, and that was wrong, and she was supposed to be married and have six kids, and she wasn't, and all this stuff. So anyway, she came to see me, and we were working through her crap, and, and, uh, and she was getting a lot of healing, and she could go home and visit and not become a puddle of tears. And this one time, I was looking on my, my ministry donation page, and I saw this large donation from this person, and I was like, is that a mistake? Is that, I just it was out of the blue and I didn't expect it. So I texted her and I said, did you make a donation to the ministry? And she said, yeah. And I said, she goes, did it, was there a problem? I said, no, I'm just curious, why? And she, what was that about? She goes, well, I'm on my way home to my family. I'm driving a badass car. I've got hair shorter than I've ever had. I'm listening to music I didn't used to listen to. I'm more in love with Jesus than I ever have been. And I just said shit when I missed my exit. That's why. <laughs> 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 
But see, she was finding her Imago Dei, she had to go through her shit and be okay with it to be able to find it. Now, the best metaphor that I think of for our Imago Dei, which is image of God in Latin, is this prism or a diamond that's multifaceted and it reflects the light. It's not the light, but it, is, it does reflect the light. And then the image of God that we are in is this, and this is my, my favorite metaphor for the Imago Dei, because it is the Imago Dei, it is the image of God. This, this icon that tells us a lot about who we are, okay? But when we don't know our Imago Dei, we feel like this, or this, or this. These are the images in my office that get most often picked by people when they're stuck in their shame. So I don't just like this metaphor of crap, people tell me this all the time. Matter of fact, recently, just a few weeks ago, I had a 10-year-old girl in my office. Her, daughter, her mom brought her to me because she found a picture of her killing herself. And so she brings her in, and, I, and this little girl picks out these images, these images, and says, I'm not enough. I'm, you know, she feels broken, she feels all these things. And, and she picked out, if you know the movie Inside Out, absolutely brilliant movie, I would recommend it to everybody and anybody. It's uh, probably one of my top 10 movies ever. But especially for the work that I do because I can talk with kids about, so there's this character sadness and she picks out this character sadness. And she says, I, I'm sad and I'm angry and I just, I, she feels bad. She, she grew, she's growing up in a charismatic church where sadness is not okay. That's, I love charismatic churches, not trying to put anything down about it, but the, the fault in the stars is that their sadness is often not okay in that kind of a church. Different churches have different things that they're okay with and not okay with. So I looked at her and I said, do you know that Jesus had sadness? She said, what? I said, do you know that the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept? No way. Yep. Jesus cried over Jerusalem. Jesus cries over our, our pain. Jesus cries with us. It says, weep with those who weep. And this girl just got so much lighter and just beaming. And I told her, I said, you know, sadness was the hero of that movie. And she'd seen it, so she, she knew. I said, go home and watch it again. Sadness is the one that saves the day in that movie. So she did that night. And her mom, I saw her mom about a week ago, and she said that she just is like, was blown away by the idea that Jesus wept that Jesus cares about that kind of stuff. I had a 14-year-old boy in the office about a week ago, also depressed, also having suicide ideation, also picks out these images, and to talk to him about how Jesus cares about our brokenness and Jesus was broken for us and lives inside our brokenness, changed his world. Both of these kids walk out like 10 pounds lighter. But when we're stuck in our shame, our image of God looks like this. It gets covered and coated and, and it, and we lose sight of this prism that's inside of us, this diamond, this pearl of great price that's within every one of us. And if we can't see it in ourselves, then we can't see it in other people. And it's going to distort our, our image of who God is because who God is is also who we are. Now, I like to use this stuff called Pudo, it's literally called Pudo, to, as the metaphor for our crap, and this one is particularly Sticky, so you know what, I'm not gonna actually pull it out. But the Pudo ends up covering like crap, it covers our Imago Dei to the point where we can't see it. And we feel like we are just a POS. That's why people pick out those kinds of images. This is who I am. I am nothing but a piece of crap. And as young as 10 years old, as young as five years old, I mean, kids can start to pick up on this from a very young age for various reasons, either because, because like a septic tank system, the parents don't own their own crap and so it flows downstream into our children because it's gotta go somewhere and if we don't own our own, then it will go somewhere because it's in a closed system and closed systems need a leach field and the kids can become the leach field or the parents or something because we're carrying it around and it, we don't have enough tank to hold it so it's gonna go someplace. Okay? Or because of bad theology, 
or because of abuse or neglect or combination of things, and also partly personality, because some personality types are more in touch with their brokenness, their humanity, than others. And so that if you happen to be a personality type that's in touch with your brokenness in a family that's a closed system that doesn't know how to own its crap, then you are going to be a, a magnet for shame. And you're going to pull it on yourself. And really, that's what this 10-year-old girl was dealing with. A family that doesn't know how to deal with their brokenness. She's a sensitive little girl who does, is in touch with her brokenness. And so she's pulling on all this. So I'm also working with the mom and the dad. So when we have that covered up with our, with our imagine that's covered up in a, the, the chocolate or the crap, and then we cover it up with something that we think is nice and shiny and bright that people will love, and that's the candy coating or the, the M&M. That's why you have M&Ms on your table, right? Because it's a metaphor for us when we are not living from the prism or the diamond inside of us. We all have our own crap, we all have our candy coating, we all have the ways that covers up. And if you think that you don't, let's go out to the pond afterwards and show me how you walk on water. Because if, you, if, you're, not do, if you're not raising people from the dead and walking on water and doing all that all the time, then you do have crap still. And it may be more hidden than others, but you do, I promise. We're all a mix of these peanuts in process. Some have more of their Imago Dei showing, and others have it nice and tight, and they think that you know, you're a mess because you have your chocolate showing, and they think they got it all together. They're actually just really stuck in their candy coating. <laughs> but to the degree that we live not in our Imago Dei, we live in a relational system called the drama triangle. The drama triangle was articulated first by a man named Stephen Karpman, but it really started in the garden. And it's an it's a upside-down way of relating that is completely antithetical to the way God designed us to be from our Mago Day. All of us know it. The world over people know it. This has been taught in countries around the world. It's, it's instinctual to us. It's every story that you see in a you know, read or, or movie that's a drama-based has these main characters. Every fairy tale has a persecutor, rescuer, and a victim. We know it because it's the way of the world apart from the Imago Dei. It is a septic tank way of up operating that requires somebody to take the blame, somebody to take the shame, somebody to find fault in. It's a shame-based system that's rooted in fear. Fear is at the root of, of all drama functioning, and again, we all know it. It's, it's instinctual to us. And if you, we all have a different way that we play in the drama. Some of us start as a rescuer, some start as a persecutor, some start as a victim. But once you're in it, you play all three roles, and you can play it all by yourself. Just me, myself, and my bad self. <laughs> me, myself, and I. I can play it out with God, and how I view God, because if I believe it about myself, I am going to have a drama view of God. Guess which one always gets, or almost always, 99.9 .9 times gets the persecutor role of the Trinity? Father. And depending on whether you are in a charismatic church or whatever, Jesus may get the victim role or persecutor role or rescuer role, depending on what kind of church you're in. But Father almost always gets the building of the persecutor. That's the way it plays out. But that's not the way God designed it to be. God, this is God in a union of three persons that work together, and there's not a good guy, bad guy, good cop, bad cop kind of thing going on. Right? In the beginning, it was just God that was three in one, operating in relationship. Or another way to look at it like this, Father, Son, and Spirit, with three different, in, working together in this union, and then we are designed to be like that in this. God, male and female. Nobody needs to take a higher, lower way because this is more like the open system of the, of the city sewer. We can disconnect from the drama triangle, and in the city sewer system, nobody needs to take the shame. 
Nobody needs to be a leech field because there is one who can take all of our shame and can have the cleansing water and, it, and recycles things and takes our crap and makes something beautiful out of it. But to the degree that we don't know our Mago Day, we will operate in a leech field type way and we will put our crap on other people. We will pour dirty water on other people. And we will eat crap ourselves from other people because we're, everybody is a mix of both being the septic tank and the leech field. We're not just one or the other. Everybody's got their own tank. And it's like God wants to say, no, okay, that works for a while, but it doesn't work to bring life. And it wants us to connect to something higher and bigger. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to come to fully understand that, to disconnect and live in this place of freedom where I don't live in shame. So these two ways of functioning, the, the city sewer on the, on the left and the septic tank system on the right are like two different lenses and they affect everything. They affect how I see the world, they affect how I read scripture, they affect how I, I interact with people, how I, what I believe about myself, everything. It's, I'm either looking through one lens or the other lens. And one is like clear water and one is dirty, muddy, gross water and worse, so thick with crap that I can't see straight. One is rooted in love and one is rooted in fear. If you have ever read anything by hospice workers, they'll tell you that there, at the end of life when people are dying, there's two things that people feel, just two either fear or love. That's all that's left at the end of life. So they're either still stuck in drama or they're feeling the, the, the love of the, of the Trinity. They're being wrapped in, the, in that already. When my mother died, I believe that she was in love. My, she died literally singing my wild Irish rose and just her heart stopped and she fell. <laughs> She was in an Alzheimer's care center and the woman that was helping her, she said she was singing and just her heart stopped. And when you, when you saw her, you could see, every time I would go to visit her, people would say, your mother, she's just, you know, she's amazing. She must have had this wonderful life. It's like, actually she had a really, really hard life. But she was very forgiving. And she forgave the people that hurt her. She took responsibility for her part of the system. If you look at this, this is another diagram of the, of the city sewer. You see the line and there's an arrow this side and an arrow that side. This half of the coin is a homeowner's responsibility. It's our responsibility to bring our shame to God. Nobody can do it for us. Nobody can forgive for us. Nobody can let go for us. That's our responsibility. The other side, is the water authority's responsibility. Isn't that cool? <laughs> when we don't live from our, when we do live from our Mago Day, it's like, this, I, this is a, a metaphor that I like as well, it's a, it's a surface level. It's a, if you know what a level is, this is one where you would put it on a table with circular concentric circles, and the little bubble inside the center, when it's, when it's centered over it, that's like John 17. I am in you, you're in me and we are one, okay, I'm, I'm centered in that. When Baxter was talking about the, being in the darkness versus being in the light, I think that's the light is when I am centered, right, and I'm level, centered in Christ, and I know who I am, and I know who you are, and I don't have to put my shame on anybody else. But when it's off kilter, I go back to the city sewer, or the septic tank, and I, and I get stuck in shame again. And I have to put, and, and, I, and just like the level, I don't always live in there. Sometimes a storm will come and it'll get me off center or something will happen and it knocks me off center. But if I know who I am, I can get back to center. I can get back to level. The best meditation contemplative practices are just about that, getting me back to center so I can learn to live from there. Because when I don't live from center, this triune relationship breaks down and it's hierarchical and somebody's going to get the crap downstream. It flows downstream. And so the, most of the people, that, especially when I get little kids in the, in the room, 
In my office, they're the kids who are downstream, and they're taking on a lot of crap because they're either too angry, too sad, or something that, like Paul said, is in the chest. They live from here, they don't live from here, and that's not the way we do it in our family, or in our world, or in our country, right? This is viewing God through the fall, and when we do, we live off-center, we live tilted. (laughs) This is, it says, formerly the old king's school shop, (laughs) circus. a school shop, the shop that was like this tilted door. Or we live like this. <laughs> right? Being the architect's daughter, of course, I'm going to use uh, house metaphors and things like that. So it says types of settlement. There's uniform settlements where you just sink down in. There's Tipping settlement, where you often without cracks, where you just like those pictures, where you're just off kilter. Or there's the one with the cracks. Different settlements with cracks. Okay? All of us, like I said, if you don't have any drama in your life and you think that you never do, then let's go out to the pond and show us how you walk on water. What I'm going to invite you to do now is to look for ways we're going to ask the Lord to show us what's a way that I am still stuck in drama, just one relationship, one area of my life. We're going to focus on that. We're going to take some time to, and on every table there's a, like a half set of cards, some images, and the images are just ways to help prompt things, okay? First I want to start with just a prayer that the Lord will show us one area, one relationship. It might be with it might be my relationship with God, it might be relationship with mom or dad, myself, my child. You could be in any one of these roles. Maybe your child is struggling and you feel like a rescuer or, you're, or they're making really bad choices and you're a persecutor and you're saying you shouldn't be doing this. Or, or maybe you feel the victim of it. Or maybe your sister or brother is rejecting you or your spouse or somebody. Somebody that you're in, a, in any way that you are struggling with. I'm going to invite you to take some time at your table using those cards to try to find an image, images. So choose a couple of few cards that just tell about this is, this is like me and this is this person, or, and it could be two parts of me. This is part of me I like, this is part of me I don't like. This is my sister, this is me. Two different images that tell about a drama that's in your life that God wants to heal. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring to mind just what you want to do in each person's life today. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. And I want to invite you to just take a few minutes, do it quickly, come up with just a, don't think about it too much, just flip through the cards and go, what jumps out at me? That, so give everybody a few of the cards or just a, like a handful, divide them up and just kind of move them around the table until you find a couple that, mat, that tell you about a drama that you're in. One for you and one for the other. It could be you with God, you with another, or you with yourself. Let's come back together. We're going to do a prayer exercise. I want to invite you to hold those images that are you and this other. Hold them in your hands. I invite you to close your eyes. We're going to walk from, we're going to walk out of drama into redemption. The Lord says, I stand at the door and knock. He waits for us to come with our shame. As I said to somebody yesterday, bringing our shame to God is the greatest gift that we can do because it's disconnecting from the septic tank into city sewer. So we're going to, and it also says, turn towards me and the veils will be removed. Nothing exists outside of that bubble of the, of the uh, surface level. Even when you're tilted, you're still in God. We're just going to turn so we can get, get it tilted. If you're, if you're feeling in shame, it's because you're tilted, and we're just going to go the other direction, okay, towards God. So I want you to close your eyes and feel what it feels like when you're in this place of drama. 
Notice in your body, notice what you feel, what you think. And the Lord says, turn towards me. So turn away from this situation. Turn away from the person, from yourself. Turn away. Turn towards the Lord. Just in your spirit. The veil is right behind you. Turn towards the Lord and let God be with you in the way that you can let God be with you. Father, Son, and Spirit, whatever you're comfortable with, God, we pray that you would meet your beloved there. Make your presence known. Give them eyes to see. Bring these parts of you and this other to the Lord. God, I pray that you would hold out your hands, support this person with your presence. Help hold these two images. Lord, what do you say about these? Who do you say this person is? What do you want to say about this situation? If you can't bring the other into the presence, it's because of judgment. We cannot bring something we judge because we're playing the role of God. So if you can't bring the other into the presence, I invite you in your heart to just say, God, I give up my right to judge. Even yourself, if you can't turn towards the Lord and you can't step through the veil, it's because you are being judge of yourself. God, I give up my right to judge myself, others, you, everything. I don't make a good God. I invite you to declare that in your heart. If you are judging your father because he's a blankety blank blank and you can't bring him in, then I give up my right to judge my father. I give up my right to judge myself, my mother, my sister, my brother, whoever. I bring them before you. Stand before the Lord the way we were created to be in the light with this person. Vengeance is not mine. It's yours, Lord. Just spend a moment. Lord, what do you want to say or do here? Maybe you need to forgive. Maybe you need to let go. God, what needs to happen? And what do you want to say? God, I pray that you give us new eyes to see. I pray that you would help leech out. You are the the only one that can bear our shame, where it doesn't have to go downstream to somebody else. See yourself letting go of the things that you've been carrying. Let them disconnect the shame bucket. God, I give it to you. I release my judgments. I release my pain, my hurt, my expectations. God, is there anything else that you want to say or do? Let the Lord bring a new image to your mind about who you are, about who the other is. Just let it rise up out of your spirit. What is that? How does he redeem that thing that you brought in? What does it look like when you wash off the, the crap from it? Let him take a hose to it and show you what's underneath it. God, what do you say about your your son or daughter? Anybody want to call out what they sense the Lord saying about who you are or who the other is? Free. Accepted. Accepted. Open. Open. Delightful. Delightful. Say it again. Bride. Bride. Breathing. Breathing. When we're in the septic tank system, we can't breathe very well. Beloved Beloved son and beloved daughter.
God, I pray that as we go from here, that we will have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that feels, and the wisdom to know the difference of when we're living from the city sewer and when we're operating in the septic tank system. Help us to know deep in our being that nobody can take our shame but you. Nobody deserves our shame but you. That is the only place that it can get cleaned up without getting passed around. I pray that you bring to mind more in our hearts and our minds the places that we are stuck that we would need to bring to you. And I pray that you teach us how to live from that center where I am in you and you are in me. I'd like to close with just this. Putting these two icons together, the Trinity and the, the Christ icon, the Pentocrator, if God is Trinity and Jesus is the face of God, then all of God is in the Imago Dei. All of God is in the Imago Dei which is in you, which is in the other, in us, whether they know it or not. Pray in your most precious name, Lord. Amen.